So, respected speakers and panelists and dear participants, Assalamu alaikum and very good evening. You are welcome and uh, thank you for joining today's webinar uh, on the topic is ba basics of Facebook. You all have known that the, it is the third day of the episodes of the uh, uh, some lectures on this topic. And I hope that you joined the earlier uh, sessions and enjoyed a lot. I'm Dr. Mohan Mustafizur Rahman, working as an assistant professor of cardiac electrophysiology at NICBD. It's my pleasure to moderate this session again for the third time on this topic. It is our pleasure to have two lectures today uh, on this topic and by the two experienced speakers who will share their knowledges. First one session will be on the pacemaker troubleshooting by his experience by Professor Dr. Mohan Mohsin Sensar from NICVD. And second session on pacemaker programming basics by PK Gobind from India. Uh, we have also the discussion and question and answer session at the end of, at the, end of the sessions. Uh, if you have any questions on during the lectures, you can please type, the, type it on the chat box at the bottom of the control panel. And we will take it, uh, bring it at the end of the session and our speakers will be very happy to uh, take these questions. So let us start our sessions, our first session by uh, Professor Dr. Mohsin Hussain So uh, it's my Pride to introduce Professor Dr. Mohsin Hussain Sir. He is currently the Professor of Cardiology and Head of the Department of the Cardiac Electrophysiology and Pacing at NICBD at Dhaka. He is working more than 15 years in the field of intervention in cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology in Bangladesh. And uh, he is the most prominent and professional in the field of PP in Bangladesh at present. He is also the member of Bangladesh Heart Rhythm Society and member of Bangladesh Cardiac Society. And he's also the member of the Society of Bangladesh Society of Cardio Cardio uh, Cardiovascular Intervention. He's also one of the leading proponents of CRT therapy in Bangladesh at present. After all, he's my teacher, my mentor, and also my unit chief. In my eyes, he is the most efficient and skilled person in electrophysiology in Bangladesh. So uh, I would like to request Mr. Mo Dr. Professor Mohsin Hussain sir to uh, start your session by sharing your screen. Thank you, sir. Professor Mohsin Hussain sir. Can you hear this slide? Oh, ah, sir, visible and clear. Respective teachers, Professor Athar sir, and uh, other faculties. And thank you for the nice introduction. I'm going to present this for the table shooting. This is mainly very basic, mainly on clinical ground. So we can understand the uh, by ECG, by X-ray, by clinical history, how can we identify the pacemaker troubleshooting? How to approach uh, the patient with troubleshooting of the pacemaker? We have to first see the hemodynamics of the patient. Is it stable or not? By seeing the ECG, chest X-ray, and identify the device type and the vendor and interview the device by which we can approach the tablets of the patient. This is for the pacemaker patient, how it's helped. Uh, is there any pacing by ECG? Initially, we have to look for the pacing spike present or not. And then we have to make sure the capture, if there is a capture, is it atrial or ventricular or both? POF and POF morphology. We have to see, is it appropriate? That is, rate is correct, AB relationship is correct, and AB interval. We have to see the for pacing. As for sensing function, all the native beats are sensed correctly. We have to look for it. Do the 
do the inhibit or trigger the next phase complex. So initial ECG we have to see look for this. In this ECG, we can see pacing spike sometimes quite small. So very uh, careful you have to look for the ECG. So the current new ECG machine is very filtering capacity is very good. So it is very difficult to see the pacing spike. So sometimes we saw the reports, but the, uh, there is LVB. So we cannot see the pacing spike. So initially we have to see the pacing spike. In this case, uh, first two, three bits, it looks like uh, white QS LP morphology, but there is no complex. So, uh, but carefully seeing there is a spike is there, spike is there, spike is there. So this is the pacing spike. So initially we have to, if we see the ECG, so we have to, this is the ECG spike. So, so sometimes it's very difficult to see, but the good filtering machine, it is very difficult to see. So we have to see for the spike, the pacing spike. What is capture? Capture is the when there is electrical stimulus from the generator box managed to cause depolarization and contract the microdent. That is minimum amount of currents needs for microdent depolarization. That is it produces pacing spike and followed by P and QRS or PQRS. In this ECG, it first bit is the spike followed by depolarization. That is the and this capture bit. Next spike followed by QRS, phase QRS, and this is the pacing spike, but there is no capture, there is no pacing complex. So, this is pacing, and this is uh, one kind of marker channel you can see. This is not pacing bit, this is sensing bit. So, so look for the that is the pacing spike followed by the native QRS. So, it is a BBI pacing meter, it is the uh, pacing followed by QRS complex. This is the loss of capture. How you can see the loss of capture initially is phase QRS complex, phase QRS complex, phase QRS long pause. But you can see here there is a spike, 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 spike. So, but there is capture. So it is called loss of capture. This patient will, if it's for a long time, so it is produced syncope. And the lower panel, you can see also there is a spike and PR interval is long, first degree heart block, spike but does not capture. So it is also loss of capture. So if the uh, spike and there is followed by no depolarization, so it is loss of capture. By ECG we can identify very carefully. This is a common problem for patient to capture failure. How do you interpret this DDD pacing? You can see here there is a spike POF, then spike PR interval, P, uh, spike followed by QRS complex, same, 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 same. In this, there is spike, at the spike, there is no POF, and there is a, a ventricular spike and paste bit. So, in this two bit, we cannot see the <coughs> POF. So, it could be at the pacing or not. The next issue you can see here is the at the lead failure to capture. In this to be that is absence of POF, but ventricular is kept up constantly. So this is the sometime we we cannot see the POF, but the spike followed by the QRS uh, POF. So very carefully uh, we have to see the POF is capturing or not. So in this ECG there is a absence of POF that is actual failure to capture. This is failure to capture the POF. Failure to capture most common cause is the lead fracture and this loss is the most common cause. By ECG, we can see it. There is a lead fracture is there and this is an atel and ventricular atel lead is this loss. So this is a common cause in the left panel. We can see the lead disdosment is the most common. Perforation, the screw loose, pocket, AI in the pocket. And the lead failure is the scarring of the myocardium, lead fracture, and lead insulation or lead insulation break, battery failure, metabolic or drug effect. Which are the common cause of the failure of the capture. Now we come to the sensing. This is the pacemaker common function is the pacing and sensing. Now, what is the problem of sensing? Sensing is correctly determined if there is an intrinsic rhythm or not. 
So pacemaker will determine if there is an increasing rhythm they can see or not and necessary for demand pressure. It also necessary for the demand pressure. If there is no intrinsic rhythm, it will pass. So it is the two important function. Uh, determine the intrinsic rhythm, they will see the intrinsic rhythm is present or not. If the intrinsic rhythm is present, they will inhibit it. If there is no intrinsic rhythm, they will pass. This is called demand pressure. Failure of sensing is under sensing and over sensing. This is most too common. The under sensing is missed P and R wave. That could be, have been sensed. This P and R wave should be sensed, but it could miss. And in spite, when they cannot see the P and R wave, in spite of sensing, the pacing is there, they give the pacing. So they cannot see the P and R wave, and instead of that, they are giving the pacing spike. And over sensing, mistake. Intrinsic electrical activity or intrinsic cardiac events. No pacing event, though it should be. So, the mistake intrinsic electrical activity for intrinsic cardiac event. And I will give you the example. And no pacing event, though it should be, there is no pacing event because they saw the uh, another activity, electrical activity other than the cardiac activity. I will show you. And that will mistake as an intrinsic and it will inhibit and they do not give the pacing. This is under sensing, pacemaker does not see the intrinsic beat and therefore does not respond appropriately. In this pacing you can see here, the pacing, pacing in this here, we can see here, they cannot see the R wave. So there is a pacing spike after the QRS complex. Here it cannot see the R wave, uh, so it is, <laughs> and the, here, this pacing, pacing, here it is not, it, it cannot see the ROI, QRS complex, so the pacing is spike after the QRS complex. So here, it also the pacemaker cannot see the QRS complex. This is also here, this is the intrinsic bit and she will deliver the pacemaker. Yeah. So they cannot see the intrinsic QRS complex and they deliver the pacing spike. Uh, this is the pacemaker under sensing. In this example, you can see here, this is the uh, RBV morphology. There is a no P, Q, R, S, T. This is P and a spike and no capture. Here also that the, the spacing is spike after the QS complex. So in this case, both, they cannot sense and pass. This is both capture and sensing failure. So in ECG, we can both identify pacing. If there is a spike and there is no depolarization, so it is captured failure. If there is the uh, sensing failure, we can see the spike after the QRS complex. So it is called pacing and sensing failure. In this ECG, here we can see there is a spike followed by POF and then a spike followed by QRS complex. Here, POF, after the POF, there is a spike and there is a interval and then spike followed by QRS complex. Here is P wave and then followed by QRS complex. Here only P wave. Here is spike followed by QRS complex, then spike QRS complex. Here P wave, after the P wave, there is a spike and, and there is a spike followed by QRS complex. Same thing is there, same thing is there. So in this case, uh, this is mainly pacemaker does not sense the POF, that is the under sense of the POF. So, this is the under sensing of the POF. It is at tail pacing immediately after the POF. So, it does not sense the POF. So, deliberately after the point does not sense the POF. So, deliberately spike. This is all. So, this is the under sensing of the POF in 12th my pacemaker. Possible cause is a small cardiac signal with an lead cellular insulation break or fracture. Programming sensitivity too high. That is, number is very high. If you put this sensitive number is high, so it can understand. This is the sensitivity setting is high. This is the possible, possible cause of the under sensitivity. Over sensitivity. 
inhibition of the pacemaker by the events of the pacemaker should be ignored. That is electromechanical interference, TOF, and myopathy. These are the common that could interfere with the oversetting and pacemaker will be inhibited. Here you can see the spike followed by Kios complex, spike followed by Kios complex. You can see here the intrinsic bead and the marker channel there is a sensing is a sensing something. So there is nothing is there. So pacemaker is inhibited by the external signal. So it is uh, what is this? With marker channel, you can see here the intrinsic activity, but in surface there is no activity. So pacemaker is inhibited by the external signal. It could be POF or ROF and the external electrical signal other than the intended POF or POF. ROF is detected. Overcharging dual chamber pacemaker also by the you here you can see by the tube by the oversensing it can be inhibited. The most common cause is myopotential inhibition, electromagnetic interference, tube outside the receptor field like this here, distorted fractal lead, and in the appropriate sensitivity setting. Sensitivity setting is the most important programming part of the oversensing. Here you can see here this is there is a heart speed is there, there is a pacing is there, pacing, there is no the spike and there is uh, absence of capture. So this is inhibited. So um, since a single thermal pacemaker by the artifact external source, the pacemaker can inhibit by seeing the external source. And pseudo fusion and fusion bit is one kind of this is not malfunction, it is pseudo malfunction. This is sinus bit and this is capture bit mainly pacing followed by KRS complex that is the capture bit. And this is a fusion bit, that is the when the spike and the normal conduction combination of both is bit in between the sinus and phase bit. And the pseudo fusion bit, when there is spike over the QRS complex, but the bit looks like sinus bit. So it is pseudo fusion bit. We can see in the pacemaker. In this example, you can see on the surface is the top, in the middle in the actual electrogram, in the bottom in the arm. So it is by binocular pacing. You can see there's the actual fibrillation is going on, and there is a pacing spike, spike, this pacing, QRS complex. This complex is different, and this complex is different. So this is the pacing complex, pacing bit, and this is the pseudo fusion bit, this, and this is the fusion bit this is different. This is in between the capture and in between the sinus bit, and this is again the capture bit. So pseudo fusion we can find in the ECG. So we cannot say it is malfunction, but it is the pseudo function of the pacemaker. When the pacemaker and the uh, intrinsic rate become closer, similar, then it can be happen. Electromagnetic interference. Electrical magnetic interference is defined as any non-physiological electrical signal that interferes with the pacemaker function. This is the uh, <coughs> definition of the electrical interference. How is caused the re radiated or conducted energy, either electrical or magnetic, which can interfere with the function of the pacemaker in the demand mode. So, when the external source electrical activity, they like cautery or diathesis, the pacemaker will inhibit it. So, the electromagnetic field is the most commonly we can find in the hospital, the common cause in the left side and the right side is the electric one. The most common is the magnetic resonance imaging, but now the uh, MRI compatible pacemaker, it does not happen. Most common is the electrocautery. We are using. and spinal cord stimulant. A lot of uh, diathermy inhibitory. This is the radiotherapy. These are the common cause in the electromagnetic interference. And cellular phone. This is a regular. The newer device does not interfere with this. But the metal detector, uh, electronic article, at the balance device, high voltage power lines. And transformer. These are the common uh, source of electromagnetic interference that can inhibit the pacemaker. This is crosstalk. Crosstalk is the sensing of the pacing stimulus delivered in the opposite chamber, which results in undesirable pacemaker response that is false inhibition. That is the <coughs> here you can see there's the atrial capture, ventricular capture, A phase, B phase. Here you can see the atrial phase, but the 
there is no ventricular capture this atrial this ventricular capture is absent because the ventricular lead sends this atrial capture by atrial spike and so they inhibited and there is capture so ventricular inhibition due to the part filtering of the atrial output that is the ventricular lead can sense the atrial spike they inhibited and if this going on for long time the patient will go on as a stroke in our clinical setting temporary pacemaker when is there and there is a rb lead so the pacemaker lead can uh, the <coughs> pacemaker lead can uh, sense the spike of the uh, temporary pacing lead and inhibit the permanent pacemaker lead so we, in that case we are very much careful about that it is prevented by programming the ventricular sensitivity to less than the desired level also this is the most importantly by safety pacing is designed for to prevent the cross stop deliver a ventricular pace 100 millisecond after an initial pace beat you can see here this is pace beat atrial pace ventricular sense here you can see after one 10 millisecond there is a ventricular there is a pacing so this is the uh, ventricular safety pacing designed for the inhibition of the mainly due to cross stop how to prevent the cross stop there is a programming in the, the, the FD pacemaker have the safety pacing to prevent the cross stop here in this ECG we can diagnose what is the diagnosis here is we cannot see any spike a pqrs pqrs most likely there is a small signal here you can see atrial phase ventricular phase but here is atrial phase there is no qrs complex atrial phase there is no qrs complex atrial phase so so there is a capture failure there is ventricular capture failure in this ECG you can see here the pacing spike is there correct correct timing but there is no qrs complex Chaos complex is absent in this year. So it is failure of the ventricular capture. Is in the ECG, is there in pacing? You can see here atrial cell, ventricular phase, atrial cell, ventricular phase. This is the one of the this is accurately sense or not. This is the question. Atrial cell, ventricular phase, a phase. This is another beat. So we can go there. Mainly the early. <coughs> This is the ectopic beat. This ectopic beat is sensed properly and correctly, and because it is the outside the post atrial ventricular diaphragmatic tube. So, this atrial ectopic beat is sensed correctly, and QS complex is also sensed correctly. So, it is a normal APS BPS, and atrial ectopic beat also sensed POF and QS complex also sensed correctly. What is apartheid behavior? That is the <coughs> Pacemaker, it is pseudo function. Pacemaker won't give it. Caused by the atrial rate when exceed the upper threshold. Here you can see here pacing, pacing, atrial ventricle capture, and there is a block. So when the atrial rate exceed the upper threshold rate, and there will be one give it, a block. So <coughs> and this is due to the rate of the upper the atrial rate exceed the dual chamber, exceed the upper threshold rate. In that case, there will be pacemaker won't give it. And twist to one upper behavior, it is caused by atrial rate exceeding the total atrial diffraction rate. Total atrial diffraction rate in that case, twist to one block. We can see here there is a APS, there is a another loss with atrial ventricular capture, there is another capital loss. So uh, <coughs> there will be twist to one if you block in the ECG. How do you interpret the ECG? Dual thermal pacemaker rate is 115. You can see here. There is a essence air alternative essence BPS rate is very high, so it could be there is the <coughs> most likely the but basically dual rate the basal rate is 60, so essence BPS, so it could be <coughs> uh, most likely the best mother mediated area. How it's do we can see here when there is the PVC, <coughs> it is also known as end loop take area, the rate to get. You have been sensed by the intrinsic device as an intrinsic actual depolarization and device response to is rate to get pure by pacing the ventricle. Here you can see this is the PVC, which goes to the ventricle 
when the v conductor is present in that case the pacemaker mini take away can happen it goes to the atria and the ventricular channel is uh, go again in the ventricle so the endless take it like even your rent take away it going on so the anterior limb is the pof sent by the atria and the retrograde limb is the through the via conduction so this is the uh, end loop tachycardia or pacemaker mediated tachycardia it is one of my patient 65 years old female presented with palpitation and a history of dual thumb pacemaker implantation this is you can see here this is a rate is most likely 130 or something like that so so we thought uh, uh, this patient has intermediate palpitation in the whole thorough we can find out this ecg and after at the phase they get terminate there is a phase b phase so it is most likely actual take at the pacemaker mediated tachycardia so pacemaker mediated tachycardia initiated by the pvc and then terminated by the pmt algorithm a lot of algorithm is here there is mainly i will show you later on the post at atrial ventricular refractory period is the algorithm that can terminate the tachycardia here you can see the ventricular sense this is a atrial this is ventricular channel a sense b phase a sense b sense a phase b sense and here we can see there is a retrograde conduction so the at end loop of the pmt is going on and the pmt is terminated by the algorithm so pmt is terminated so the pacemaker own algorithm has own algorithm if does not uh, terminate we can terminate by the what the these are the a possible solution how to terminate the pmt apply the magnet over the device to disrupt the loop adjust the pacemaker setting that is extended post atrial ventricular refractory post ventricular atrial refractory period auto extended pvr after the pvc device nowadays have pm termination algorithm also sometimes it can happen if there is the atrial capsule loss so sometimes we only phase the atria which can terminate the pmt in summary we can conclude ecg can be very helpful for troubleshooting pacemaker when not able to integrate the device immediately understanding of the device function and programming is essential device or lead filler may be intermittent device integration is needed to identify diagnose system malfunction Thank you very much for patient care. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. Very shortly, I will present the basic algorithm, basic uh, common problems that we encountered in your clinical practice. So I made uh, my lecture very short. There is so uh, common problems that we can face in the clinical practice that I present here. Sir, do you finish finish your lectures already? I I have finished my talk. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. So thank you, uh, Professor Mohsen Hussain sir, uh, for your brilliant and elaborate lecture and brief lecture on the presentation of troubleshooting in your own experience. And uh, let us uh, uh, before going to the next session, uh, it is we are very, it is great to have a lot of. Uh, faculty and our respective teachers are in the participants list so uh, may i request all of them before going to the next session uh, the talk will be by given by the, the mr tk govin before going to that uh, our respected teachers uh, professor abdul wadud choudhury sir uh, professor um, dr kajol kumar karmakar sir and uh, dr jilur rahman sir and uh, ashok dotto sir sir uh, may i request you to give some comments on the lecture on that or uh, the end of the total session you want to uh, give your comments
Kazi, can you can you unmute, sir, uh, Professor Abdul Chidri, sir, or yes, sir. Let me let me unmute unmute uh, them. See here. Professor Mohsin has given a very precise, accurate, and to the point lecture. I like it very much. Thank you, Mohsin. Thank you, sir. Because the problem that we uh, encountered in our clinical practice, we should discuss about this. Because there's a lot Recap. of things. So, so I would be uh, lecture that would be So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, any comments from Ashok Dutta, sir? Mohsin, you should have mentioned something in the PMT. PMT sometimes look like sinus tachycardia. Yes, sir. Okay. So the point is, you don't see any P wave. Very difficult to see. <laughs> you don't see any P. And that's the, that's suggest it's PMT. That's the clinical clue. Sir, can I, can I say something about it, sir? Polish? Sir, yeah, sir a very, very, very simple thing to say that the uh, PMT can be terminated by SAR is already most in SAR told that the by uh, programming that the increase the P bar to uh, not to have the PMT again. But a very simple tool is to put a magnet over the pacemaker to stop the PMT in the emergency. It's a very, a very effective measure, and all you have to we have to know it. Yeah, because I have seen sometimes people are giving beta blockers, but that won't work. Yeah. And for beta blocker to work, you have to see that it's a atrial tracking a ventricular pacing, then it's sinus tachycardia. But yes. it's, you don't see any P wave. So you suspect it to be empty, put yes. a magnet over that. And yes. as Mosin has said, if you want to program it, you can program it. Right, sir. So, Atas, sir? Uh, Mustafa, I sir. think... Uh, Can I go to, the, go to the next session? Yeah, that's because the TK Govindu will discuss about this issue. And okay, I think uh, motion is so excellent that uh, possibly there is no... Uh, only there are a few questions. So, but one thing I want to discuss, Mustafa, is there any drug to treat the uh, PMT? Is there any role of the drug? Mm. The, patient is on, the patient is on PMT. There is no magnet. Sir. There is no company available. What to do? That answer it can be uh, given by you, sir. Better to... <laughs> no, no. Motion? Possibly, possibly, sir. Not possible, sir. It is, sir, end loop tachycardia, like the empty tachycardia. It is no drug will. So, uh, Drag will effect or not, I don't know, sir. But uh, uh, because the all the pacemaker have the whole algorithm, automatically the P bar will extend. So PMT going on and automatically terminate. Uh, so it is not going continuously. Sir. So it, uh, my idea, the patient that I saw, they have to uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes palpitation and automatically terminate. So by interrogating, there is a PMT. So, any drug can uh, interfere, I don't know. Mosin, I wonder, what is the pathway of this electric EPF? Does it involve the uh, a, a junctional tissue? That mainly, it is two mechanisms, but PVC is the main. And if there is a at 12th month always it needed, so if there is actual capital loss, this is the two mechanisms by which the PMP can initiate. So the PBC can go through this and 
and a trigger conduction must have so it goes to the the native complex and the atrial lead it can sense yeah, and be pressed i can talk with in this issue can you help yeah yeah sir 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 you want the sadi sir yes share share your comment sir uh, comment the pmt has integrate and retrograde pathway in retrograde pathway it involves the ab node so the drugs which blocks the ab node may be helpful like beta blocker verapamil adenosine and uh, that's why i was asking so and- this oh. matter carotid message help carotid yeah. message magnet should be tracked first uh, drug may be helpful may not be helpful but yeah. drug may be used retrograde conduction should be intact sir this is the prerequisite for uh, pmt sir abnormal retrograde retrograde conduction should be intact so point uh, so and- Is that Atar Bhai was asking? Is any drug effect yeah. on that retrograde path? Okay. Yes, Atar Bhai. That. Actually, Atar Bhai. Hello. Mm, yes. Sir, sir, you are audible, sir. Bolan, sir. Yes. Now, actually, the, man, uh, this is the message for our uh, participant. At uh, thanks to Dr. Sadi Bhai that he has also contributed. So this is the simple. Actually, like all other. Reentry take idea. AV nodal dependent reentry take idea. PMT is also AV nodal dependent reentry take idea. Yes. So carotid message and any AV nodal drug like adenosine and uh, how, that is the the way we treat the uh, AV nodal or AV nodal like the the right. uh, so these drugs also work to target the take idea. But yes, the take idea may again restart. That is the problem. So PVRP is the final solution. But for immediate management, carotid sinus masses or even nodal blocking drug, the same way the drugs works in the AVNRT or AVRT here also works. It is one kind of the AVRT. That is PMT is a kind of the AVART. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ashok Dutt, sir, will you share? Will you give any comment? To the discussion. No, so, I think, uh, what is my? Sir, I'm going to move to the session. Yes, you can move to the next session. Okay. So, let us move to the next session. And next session, in our speaker will be the uh, Mr. T.K. Govind uh, from Medronic, who is currently working as a consultant in the CAHF division and is the most experienced trainer at the mo- uh, of Medronic pacemaker family. Uh, he has more than 25 years of experience and uh, very great to uh, hear from his uh, side a very experienced person and very clear conception so uh, i would like to request mr tike govind to start his session thank you thank you sir thanks for that uh, kind introduction and the good words um, and i would like to also thank uh, all other faculty Uh, who are also contributing to this uh, thank you so much so the this session is about programming and we will revisit some of the concepts that uh, dr mohsin and dr adhar and dr wadu choudhury uh, have uh, discussed namely particularly the pre uh, pacemaker mediated tachycardia and we'll see the parameters that are relevant to that now we are assuming that uh, we have implanted a pacemaker and then all the parameters both in the atrium and the ventricle are good and you have just connected that pacemaker and we also imagine that this patient has a normal sinus node function and an av block uh, you can imagine that this patient has a normal ventricular function and then uh, age is around 60 65 just like a pacemaker uh, age group of patient and let us say that this patient also has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation which you know from his history so we want to program the pacemaker for this patient so namely uh, patient with av block with normal sinus node function so the first question comes to our, our mind is what mode do we want to program 
And yes, the options are you can program DDDR, you've given a, a pacemaker, DDDR pacemaker. The patient wanted the best pacemaker and you decided to give the best one that is available. That is a DDDR pacemaker. And that also has the MVP mode. I'm sure you recognize the MVP mode by this annotation and it will not be written as MVP because it's, it transitions between AI and DDD depending on the status of AV conduction. So by history, now we assume that this patient has a permanent AV block. So in this patient, giving an MVP mode will not make any uh, clinical sense because there is no AV conduction. And so it's, it's a good idea to consider programming either a DDD or a DDDR mode. So at this point, you are always confronted with a point of whether should I program DDDR mode or a DDD mode, right? So we assume that this patient has a normal sinus node function and during the timing cycle discussion, we already touched upon the fact that you, for a normal sinus node function, the sinus node is functioning well, so he is expected to have a good chronotropic competency. So his sinus node is going to fire at an appropriate rate according to the metabolic need of the pacemaker uh, patient. And so uh, we want to ideally leverage the patient's sinus node function, which is a perfect rate response mechanism for any patient. If you program DDDR for a patient that has a normal sinus node function, it is possible that for any given activity, the patient may need a slightly lower rate and the pacemaker sensor indicated rate may be faster than that. So it may unnecessarily pace the atrium, which may not be required. And that might sometimes uh, result in a competitive pacing as well. So it's a good idea to consider programming DDD mode for a patient that has a normal sinus node function. So as a result of that, it's going to sense atrium and pace the ventricle all the time. And when the patient is uh, becoming active or uh, any time when the patient's metabolic need increases, the sinus ra rate is going to increase because of the normal function of the sinus node. And that is going to result in an increase in the ventricular rate as well. So if you are sure that this patient has a normal sinus node function, even if you decide to give a DDDR pacemaker, it may be a good idea to consider programming to a DDD mode. So that's one point uh, that I want to make. And of course, um, if you know that this patient has an intermittent chronotropic incompetence, then it may be worthwhile considering programming the rate response. Also remember, uh, if the patient, uh, the rate response of the pacemaker essentially comes from mechanical movement of the patient. And if the patient has any other, uh, you know, reason for metabolic need increase, like fever, anger, etc., or excitement, then the uh, the conventional accelerometer-based uh, accelerometer pacemaker may not increase the rate appropriately. So it may be uh, good to uh, you know, leverage the patient's normal sinus node function. So for this patient, programming a DDD mode may be uh, appropriate. And I saw one um, text was coming. I, I'm not sure if anybody wanted to make a comment or uh, chat. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. I, I think uh, we should discuss simultaneously. Otherwise, after the end yeah. of the, uh, the, uh, the ease of your topic will be Actually, we cannot remember. So in this situation, I want to ask you a question. That is the, what we are talking about. The sinus node function is okay. Yes, sir. Competence is okay. That is DDD mode, not the DDDR, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, sir can we uh, make the program that is DDDR, but upper rate is 120 or 130 like this? What would be the problem in that situation? That is DDDR, but the upper rate is set at 130 or 120. Then what will be? Right. So let's program that also. And so that we know what we are doing. So I'm programming DDDR upper tracking rate to 140. You're talking. Right. About. Right. Okay. So fine. So if we program and, and uh, if it is DDDR, then we need to also program the upper sensor rate. In this case, 130. Do you want to maintain it at 130 or uh, do you want to? Okay. 140. Okay. So then that also is 140. So if we program both of this once again so long as the patient has a normal sinus node let's say he is now doing a brisk walk 
So when he is doing a brisk walk, then his sinus rate may go to 140 beats per minute, maybe between 130 and 140 beats per minute. Then it will a sense v pace a sense v pace will what will go on. But assume that you know if the rate response parameters are programmed slightly more aggressively, and then for that activity that he is doing. If the sensor indicated rate is faster than the patient's sinus rate, then it would do A pace and V pace, which is okay. But then the only thing is you are unnecessarily pacing the atrium. So there is nothing wrong in programming, uh, you know, DDDR mode for a patient with sinus node dysfunction. But it, it programming this way is also useful in another context, which is. Um, Dr. Mosin actually touched upon that patient, uh, you know, experiencing the Venki bug behavior or the two is to one pacemaker block behavior. You know, when uh, the patient's sinus rate becomes faster than the upper tracking rate with normal sinus node function, and the patient is an AV block patient. As long as the sinus rate is below 140 beats per minute, then it will be a sense we pace a sense we pace. The moment the sinus rate becomes faster than 140 beats per minute, and this is the time when the pacemaker Venkibag behavior kicks in. So what happens is it has to the ventricle in the ventricular channel the upper tracking rate interval will kick in. So if if it it has to pace the ventricle at a rate faster than 140, it will not pace. It will wait for the upper tracking rate uh, interval of. Uh, you know, in this case, maybe one uh, for, uh, 450 millisecond. It'll wait for about 450 millisecond and only then pace the, the ventricle. So as a result of that, the AV interval gets extended and it'll go on getting extended till a point it will miss tracking it because that P wave will fall in the PVARP. That is when the uh, when uh, one, one P wave would have fallen in the PVARP. Now, at this time, if you have not programmed DDDR, let us say we had only programmed DDD, there will be a short pause-like thing that might happen. It will be an actual Venkibak-like thing, but it's a pacemaker Venkibak. But if you program DDDR for this patient, at that spot, you will find, and also the sensor-indicated rate is also approximately around 140, it will prevent that pause. It is useful from that standpoint. So it is both good and it's it's it could be bad as well, but the other point, if you don't want that pacemaker when kibak to happen, then you might increase the upper tracking rate for your patient. So let's say this patient is a brisk, uh, briskly active patient, and uh, you find that patient comes next time, and it's worthwhile looking at the histogram, and you find in the histogram in the atrial channel you find sinus rates are happening at rate faster than 140 beats per minute the next time you can increase that rate to 150 beats per minute. So that's the interaction that, that it will have. So you can do either way. It, it's not going to seriously harm the patient. Um, yeah, so sometimes it might pace the atrium. The only time it, it might pace the atrium would be um, when the sensor indicated rate uh, given by the pacemaker is actually faster than the patient's sinus rate, which is also okay. It's going to A pace and B pace. So, does it answer the question, sir? Yes, thank you. Go in. There yes, is sir. A, there is another problem in case of the sinus node dysfunction. Pa yes, sir. Is, uh, that is a, a chronotropic competency is okay. Yeah. But the patient do have uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, not too frequently, but sometimes like once or twice in a month. Yes, sir. And patient feels symptom when there is a transition. There is a uh, uh, there is a pacemaker mode switch is on. Yes. During the transition from the uh, DDD mode to the VVI mode, the patient feels the symptoms. Is mm. there any role of DDI pace, that is DDI programming in such situation, DDI? Okay. Do so, I, yeah, I mean, uh, on the one hand, you can permanently program to DDI. If your patient is, uh, you know, as you mentioned, is a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation patient, then, uh, you know, permanently programming to DDI will lead to loss of AV synchrony. So, permanent program to DDI or DDIR mode is not advisable if the patient has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. 
but the uh, the pacemaker as you mentioned uh, does have a mode switch so it's going to recognize uh, atrial fibrillation and mode switch but when it mode switches particularly the metronic pacemaker it doesn't mode switch to a vvi mode it actually mode switch to as uh, dr athar pointed out to a ddir mode that means assume that this patient is doing some activity brisk walking currently it is going on at a sense we pace while is briskly walking at this time he gets atrial fibrillation the device will mode switch when it mode switch if the mode switch uh, mode becomes vvi then the rate drops patient can become symptomatic but metronic pacemaker is actually mode switch to a ddir mode when it switches to ddir mode now atrium need not be paced its atrial fibrillation it's not going to be tracked but it will pace the ventricle at the sensor indicated rate because the sensor is running in the background because you decided to program at 140 the sensor indicated rate may be 130 or something then it will pace the ventricle at the rate of 130 beats per minute so in which case patient actually will not feel the symptoms did i get disconnected hello no no oh, yeah you yeah you fine are. fine okay right so i suddenly my uh, you know the panel disappeared then i thought i got disconnected right oh, yeah, right okay right so um, in in that situation then uh, there will be ddir pacing so the ventricle will be paced at a sensor indicated rate so patient should not feel seriously symptomatic i would believe if the patient still is feeling symptomatic i would believe it it was because of a change in the av synchrony status of that patient and he should become all right in the next few minutes but as you know there are some pacemaker models Uh, as dr athar pointed out which might switch to vvi mode then uh, that might cause symptom so when it switches to ddir mode then there is no uh, problem metronic pacemaker switch to actually ddir mode when the device mode switches the patient will get the symptom also the afib so i the patient uh, when the patient is atrial fibrillation he will get palpitation when goes to ddi mode she also rate also uh, decrease so there is some problem they could uh, I, i think eh? no so unlikely if the patient gets uh, a symptom because of atrial fibrillation by itself then yes the, the patient can but otherwise the patient is less likely to be feeling symptomatic there, there is a possibility because there is a sudden loss of av synchrony that is a possible reason for symptoms otherwise most patients should not feel symptoms even even if you program to ddd mode when it mode switches it mode switches to ddir mode so then the patient should not feel symptomatic it is in non tracking mode yes ddir is a non tracking mode ddi and ddir are non tracking you will not tracking the atrial rate yeah, uh, yes and then uh, during atrial fibrillation you don't want to track the atrial rate right so that is what you do so thank you gorin welcome sir right so um, so it is it is not bad programming dd uh, dr it is um, it is definitely good but then if you program ddd then you are making total use of the patient sinus node function so which is which is okay as well so uh, either of that is not wrong you could program but if you program uh, dddr and you program the upper sensor rate faster than the upper tracking rate then the sinus uh, the sensor indicated rate may be faster than the sinus rate so that might unnecessarily place the atrium so that may be one other so in most cases at nominal settings the uh, you know upper tracking rate and upper sensor rate both are the same so it really does not really matter so while on this uh, it's worthwhile now that, that that's a that's a reasonably decent discussion already that we have had as to how to program the upper tracking rate and the upper uh, sensor rate 
So while on that, it is worthwhile uh, stretching it a little further and see what happens when the rate becomes uh, significantly faster. So when it becomes when the sinus rate itself becomes significantly faster, then there is a possibility of a pacemaker two is to one block. But imagine the rate has become faster, but it is not fast enough to cause a mode switch. So if let us say uh, the rate is below one hundred and seventy beats per minute, but faster than one hundred and forty beats per minute, then the device will not mode switch. because it is still probably sinus tachycardia that's going on that might result in a 2 is to 1 pacemaker block that might cause a uh, symptom for some patient you are not going to encounter this in a an average adult patient because in an average adult patient your age group of that patient is upwards of 60 then um, you know that will not be a problem but the problem will be if you have to implant a pacemaker in a younger patient maybe assume that a com- congenital complete heart block patient who's uh, vigorously active whose sinus rate can go to 160 170 like that so there is a possibility of a 2 is to 1 block happening and why did that that happen because alternate p waves are falling in the inside the pdrt so to check w- when the 2 uh, is to 1 block might happen if we if in our programmer if we click the upper tracking rate or the av interval here i'm clicking that button here you can see here the programmer tells us that at 150 beats per minute when the sinus rate is faster than 150 beats per minute the pacemaker will exhibit a 2 is to 1 block for this patient so assume now we started with an assumption of 60 year old man but imagine this was a, a 15 year old uh, you know congenital complete heart block patient who is otherwise normal and he is playing around and his sinus rate can go faster than uh, you know uh, 150 beats per minute then uh, the pacemaker 2 is to 1 block might happen so the way to address that would be first of all it's not allowing us to program 150 that's because in this case we have put our vt monitor rate although this is not going to do any intervention for vt the monitor rate is 140 that is why it is not allowing us so we will program the vt monitor rate to just for the sake of this programming let's say 180 beats 190 beats per minute now this will allow us to program an upper tracking rate of let us say 160 beats per minute right so you want to give 160 beats per minute one to one tracking for this younger patient who is just about 15 years old with com- congenital complete heart block now when you are checking this once again although i wanted to uh, have one is to one tracking up to 160 beats per minute you can see here this pacemaker cannot give at this programming one to one tracking at at rate more than 150 beats per minute because of the interaction of the av delay and the pvrp and i'm sure all of you will recall the discussion we had in the timing cycle av interval plus pvrp is the total atrial uh, refractory period if the sinus rate is faster than the Uh, tarp rate then two is to one block will result so now the way to resolve that would be we need to reduce the tarp if you want to re- if you want to reduce the tarp we can either reduce the av interval or we can reduce the pvrp and if you reduce the pvrp then you are exposing the patient for the risk of pacemaker mediated tachycardia so a good idea would be to consider programming a shorter uh, av delay if you program a shorter av delay it might become unphysiologic so here i am clicking the sensed av interval paced av interval does not matter we are talking about tracking so now let me program click the sensed av interval that's what i'm clicking now this is what we program since we have interval of 150 beats per minute and i am sure uh, most of you may know that the pacemakers have another feature called rate adaptive av delay here i am switching on the rate adaptive de- av delay which is nominally off and in this case i am switching it on so what i am doing is my starting av interval is 150 beats per minute now the minimum av interval that i am allowing the pacemaker to automatically reduce it to 110 beats per minute this is automatically reduced based on the uh, sinus rate so what it will do 
when the rate becomes faster than 80 beats per minute, up to 130 beats per minute, we'll gradually reduce the AV delay and it will bring it to a short value of 110 millisecond when the sinus rate is faster than 130 beats per minute. So now, when the sinus rate is faster, AV interval becomes all automatically shorter. As a result of that, the TARP becomes shorter. Now it will provide a higher upper tracking rate. Now one more time, I'm clicking the sensed AV delay. Now this will give you the, give you the calculated value. Now in this programming, uh, this patient will get one is to one tracking up to uh, the programmed rate of 160 beats per minute. Between 160 and 170, this patient will experience a Venki bar and the patient's sinus rate becomes faster than 167 beats per minute. It will go into a 2 is to 1 block. And if you want to be a little more conservative, you can even make it, let us say, 100 minimum AV interval. Then if you do that, then between up to 160 beats per minute, that's what we programmed here. I'm, I'm showing the initial screen. 160 beats per minute. This will provide, uh, you know, one is to one tracking. And beyond 160 beats per minute, uh, up to 170 beats per minute, the patient, this patient, pacemaker will provide Venki bar. And when the sinus rate crosses 170 beats per minute, then uh, that will go into a two is to one block. So that will be appropriate for the younger patient. So you can avoid... Uh, you know, without reducing the PVRP by making use of the rate adaptive AV delay. While the rate is uh, slower, you can provide the normal AV intervals. And when the rate becomes faster, the sinus rate becomes faster, you mimic the normal physiologic behavior of automatically reducing the AV delay. At the same time, provide a higher upper tracking rate without causing 2 is to 1 block. And because I'm not reducing PVARP, and chance of pacemaker-mediated tachycardia also becomes uh, lesser. So this way, you can program higher upper tracking rate for younger active individuals uh, without uh, you know them progressing into a pacemaker two is to one block. So any uh, comment from yeah, Doctor yeah. Adhar, Doctor yeah, Mohsin? Yes, 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 actually. Actually, we are more concerned about the paste AV delay. Okay. Most of the time, while programming, we are concerned about the paste AV delay. Yeah. Just please clear what is the <coughs> sense AV delay and what should be the ideal sense AV delay in relation to the paste AV delay. As okay. far as the paste AV delay is 180, what right. should be the ideal sense AV delay and what will happen if it is too short or too long, sense AV delay? Right. Okay. So, in this case, initially we are talking about sensed AV delay. In the in this case, we assume the patient has a normal sinus node function. We are programmed to DDD mode, right? So, it is only doing a sense V pace, a sense V pace. So, in this case, uh, unless the patient is being paced at the lower rate, paced AV delay will not kick in at all. So, that is one factor. So when we are a sense, we pace on sensing, what will kick in will be only sensed AV delay. But on the contrary, let us say we are programmed DDDR mode. And for some reason, there is atrial pacing happening. Only on atrial pacing, then the pace AV delay will kick in. So if a patient has a relatively uh, bad chronotropic competence, or if more often the atrium has to be paced, then you would have programmed to DDDR mode and then the paced AV delay will kick in. And the paced AV delay uh, will, will not exhibit this kind of a two is to one block because we are pacing the atrium and we have also programmed the upper sensor rate and it will never pace the atrium at a rate faster than the upper sensor rate in spite of the aggressive activity of the patient. So it will always start an AV delay and pace the ventricle. So the problem of Venki bark and a 2 is to 1 block will not happen in a patient that needs atrial pacing predominantly. So all the 2 is to 1 block and the Venki bark behavior will happen only in a patient that has a normal sinus node function and uh, where also we have programmed deliberately DDD mode. That is one aspect of that. And second is uh, Dr. Atar pointed out, uh, asked me to also talk about what should be an ideal uh, AV delay and what should be the sensed AV delay and what should be the paced AV delay. 
so uh, it is very subjective and uh, you know nobody titrates what should be the uh, proper av delay if you are doing uh, you have to do it uh, titrated using echocardiography with uh, with a good ventricular filling time uh, measurement by looking at the e wave and the a wave which normally you don't do for a pacemaker patient that has a normal ventricular function so arbitrarily it is uh, either nominal values or sense dv delay 150 uh, beats 150 millisecond and then the pace dv interval is 180 millisecond it is worthwhile keeping the difference uh, of 30 millisecond between the sense dv delay and the pace dv delay which means you want to program a uh, 30 millisecond longer pace dv delay compared to sense dv delay once again uh, going back to uh, referring to what we discussed on the timing cycle when uh, there is a sense v pace the uh, atrial contraction about a third to half of atrial contraction has already happened by the time the pacemaker is sensing the atrium so this this is the reason why we want to program a 30 millisecond shorter sense dv delay but if the patient has a sinus node dysfunction and if you have to pace all the time the pacing stimulus is what is starting the av interval so then uh, the atrial contraction starts only on an atrial pacing so ideally it's it's good to have a slightly longer av interval and if you program it uh, you know unphysiologically short av intervals then you are um, you know preempting uh, the ventricular pacing sometimes that might even encroach if it is asense we pace it might encroach even on the p wave before the complete uh, atrial contraction you may end up pacing the ventricle so you um, that you are, you are uh, Uh, you know preempting the ventricular pacing that patient might result in uh, you know pacemaker syndrome like uh, symptoms also which is possible so what would be unphysiologic if you bring it down to below 80 millisecond usually that's considered as uh, you know unphysiologic uh, av interval but you know while you're programming uh, function normally it's not a good idea to reduce it to as short as 80 millisecond it will be a good idea to consider programming a rate adaptive av interval so that during all the normal slightly lower rates you maintain a normal av interval of this kind of 120 150 millisecond as the sinus rate increases mimic the physiologic behavior and let the pacemaker automatically reduce it in this you can bring it down to 80 millisecond which is, which is a good thing so that will actually uh, you know push up the 2 is to 1 block rate even further to 180 which is definitely good for that patient so uh, dr athar uh, any uh, comment that you want to make in, in addition to that sir Uh, am i audible I'm, yeah yeah audible. thank yeah, yeah, thank right. you govindo yeah. right so th- these are uh, you know program based on the patient in front of you a little bit of interaction might happen so which is okay which is which will not make a significant difference clinically for your patient so either way is okay but the one thing that you may want to remember is if a patient is pre- normal sinus node function generally it is good to consider programming ddd mode and if you know that patient has uh, uh, sinus node dysfunction then it it's good to consider programming ddd r mode largely but you can program uh, otherwise also uh, which is not um, which will not clinically harm your patient in any way so which is also an acceptable way of program govind yes sir as there are some situation when the sinus rate is really in six uh, sinus syndrome yes sir uh, intrinsic sinus rate is low yeah that is uh, uh, most of the time the patient sinus rate lies between the 50 to 60 yes sir uh, but it can goes up but most of the time the patient uh, well uh, they raise the pace uh, and in that situation usually a pest yes sir pest happen yes in, in that situation what will be the ideal situation that is the, what will be the lower rate what will the pest be delay and yeah. how can we avoid the ventricular pacing right so yeah so you now you are imagining a patient that has an av conduction is that right sir yeah uh, av conduction is okay but the sinus oh. rate the patient sinus rate is uh, right sinus syndrome but the sinus rate is low yes for that patient you have to necessarily program ddd r mode uh, you know for a for a patient with sinus node normal sinus node function it's good to program ddd 
it's not uh, harmful to program DDDR, uh, which is okay. But then if a uh, patient with sinus node dysfunction, if you program only DDD without an R, then most of the time the pacemaker will pace only at the near lower rate. And once again, the patient will not give, get the benefit of rate response. So sinus node dysfunction patient always, uh, you know, give a DDDR pacemaker and program it to a DDDR mode, in which case you can, the upper tracking rate doesn't matter at all because the sinus rate, according to uh, uh, Dr. Adhar, is going to be uh, at a fairly low level. So tracking is not a problem. What is important is programming at the upper sensor rate. Depending on the patient's uh, target, uh, you know, maximal heart rate, you can increase the upper sensor rate in that case. In that case, concentrate more on the upper sensor rate. And once again, the problem of Venki barking 2 is to 1 block will, will not be encountered in a DDDR mode where we are predominantly pacing the atrium. So programming a normal AV delay of uh, you know, 180 millisecond, pace AV delay of 180 millisecond will be appropriate. But if the patient has AV conduction, let's say intermittent AV conduction or intermittent AV block, uh, try and program an AV interval longer than the patient's AV conduction time. Or if the patient has, a, uh, if the pacemaker you've chosen has an MVP mode, then it may be worthwhile programming the MVP mode for that patient. But program MVP with rate response so that it paces the atrium all the time and when it is in uh, when it when there is av conduction the pacemaker will be in the aair uh, uh, you know section of the mvp mode and av interval whatever you program it, it will not be a limiting factor it will allow av conduction and you will not pace the ventricle but as we discussed uh, the other day, if the patient goes into persistent AV block, then it will switch to a DDDR mode. At that time, it will, uh, while pacing uh, in DDDR mode, it will uh, apply the programmed AV interval, which will be about 180 to 100 millisecond. Once again, this is a very arbitrary value that is being programmed. So the normally accepted uh, nominal value is 180, which is, uh, clinically okay for most patients uh, unless you really want to titrate and spend time on that. So in, in this case, that's really not a matter. So if you program, give a MVP rate response pacemaker and a patient has uh, reasonable AV conduction and you want to pace all the time in the atrium and intermittent AV block, then program MVP rate response, normal AV interval of 180, 200 millisecond, which is okay. And then uh, so long as there is AV conduction, it will do a pace, rate response a pace, and AV conduction will happen even if the conduction time is 250 millisecond. So AV delay will not be a limiting factor. But if the patient develops an AV block, pacemaker will go to DDDR mode and provide a programmed AV interval to pace the ventricle, which will be 180 or 200 millisecond. Is there any comment you want to make, sir? Thank you, Govind. Yeah. So that's uh, how uh, we want to program the AV intervals and uh, uh, the upper tracking rate and the lower rate, et etc. Then, uh, yes, we may want to, uh, you know, quickly see uh, how to program the PVARP. And I'm sure all of you would have observed that in the current pacemakers, all pacemakers do have the automatically adjusting PVARP, which means that uh, you are uh, not, not, you don't need to actually bother about what the patients, if the patient has a retrograde conduction or not. So when we say auto PVARP, I click that auto button. Then I click auto button. So you get uh, this window. In this window, yes, we are in an auto mode. And then you have to program the minimum PVARP in this case, 250 millisecond. So, which is good enough. If you want for some patient, you can actually reduce also because this is an automatically adjusting PVRP. So, what it means is during the lower rates, whether it's a pace rate or a sense rate, it will maintain a longer PVRP and it will go on reducing the PVRP as the rate increases. Uh, and then it will bring it to a minimum of 250 millisecond and it will not reduce it to below 250 millisecond. 
So if in a situation, which will be very, very rare, even if you want to give higher upper tracking rate, instead of tampering with this, it is good to reduce the AV interval by making use of the rate adapt to AV delay. But in the event of you having to program a PVRP of less than 250 millisecond, it may be worthwhile considering uh, doing a VVI pacing. Your, your patient is in the hospital, we are doing a follow-up, do a VVI pacing uh, and see if there is a retrograde conduction. If the patient is not having a retrograde conduction, of course, you know, intermittent retrograde conduction might happen, but generally it does not. So you can, uh, you know, pro uh, if there is no retrograde conduction, you can reduce PVRP. But if, the, if you observe a retrograde conduction, and try to program a minimum PVRP slightly longer than the, uh, you know, V to A conduction time. You do A pace, sorry, V pace, and look for a retrograde P, measure the interval, and this PVRP should be longer than the interval that you uh, actually measure. So that will, that should take care of the PMT as well. So uh, that is the uh, PVRP programming. And... Um, with with uh, rate adaptive AV delay, automatic PVRP, that uh, that is not becoming a serious consideration. Govind. Yes, sir. Okay. Automatically set PVRP. Can yes, stop uh, pace, uh, that is PMT, that is pacemaker induced tachycardia? No, it cannot stop PMT. It, it, it will prevent the initiation of PMT. Yes, it can prevent the initiation. Okay. Yes, yes. The chances of PMT uh, initiating uh, is reasonably lesser, uh, you know, in an auto PVRP situation compared to a permanent PVRP. Let us say you have desired to program a permanent PVRP of 250 millisecond, no automatically adjusting. All the time it is 250 millisecond. Then there is a chance of uh, PMT happening. But if we can extend the PVRP, it can terminate. No. So in this case, if you program uh, extend means you have permanently programmed it to longer. So the problem there is, let's say I permanently programmed to... Uh, no, no, no. If the no. patient has PMT, we can yeah. extend the PVR, that can stop the uh, PMT? Yes, provided you program the uh, PMT intervention on. So here I'm yeah. clicking that button. Nominally, the PMT intervention is off. I'm sure now you can see my screen. PMT intervention is nominally off in all the pacemakers. So then if you want to terminate uh, a PMT happening, then you need to switch the PMT intervention on. So what is the problem if we keep on PMT keep on? Right. So it, 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 it might become a problem, not a serious problem, but a problem. The problem is, uh, let us say a PMT happens. The way the pacemaker recognizes PMT is if it is it is looking for a VA conduction, so the V to A conduction, V to A time of less than 400 millisecond. If the V to A time is less than 400 millisecond, and uh, the pacemaker assumes that PMT is going on, and then uh, extends the PVR for eight beats, so it looks for eight beats. B to A conduction time is less than 400 millisecond. Then on the ninth beat, it will extend the PVRP to 400 millisecond. So it will break the cycle. But there is a possibility that there is a patient that has a sinus tachycardia. A sense V pace is going on. Then also it will intervene. So that is the only problem. Okay. So that is why nominally it is off. And it is very rare today to see a pacemaker mediated tachycardia. If you see one, then you can switch it on. True. But in, in, the, in the current pacemaker, there is PMT confirmation uh, is also uh, brought in. Uh, Astra pacemaker is available in Bangladesh, I know. So there, you can switch it on. What it will do is, if it recognizes a PMT, then for three beats, it will reduce the AV interval and see if the VA conduction time remains constant. If the VA conduction time remains constant, it is a PMT, it will intervene. If the VA conduction time changes after reducing the AV interval, then it will say it is not a PMT and it will not intervene. 
So in that new pacemaker, that feature is now available. Uh, do we have any example of how to recognize PMT from the interrogation? Do we have any example? Right now, I may not be able to pull out. Okay, no problem. Yes, that that will take some time. So we are already, uh, you know, it's for you. It's ten o'clock almost. <laughs> it's nine thirty here. So uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so these are the little different things that you may want to keep in mind. Yes, it is today. I'm sure uh, you know not very common to come across uh, PMT. That is because of the uh, availability of auto PVAR and also the rate adaptive AV delay and uh, the chance of your actually seeing PMT are lesser. And actually, in that situation also, uh, it is not a good idea to you know consider how to overcome the PMT. Actually, if you look at the reason for the start of the PMT, it would usually be a loss of atrial capture or loss of uh, atrial sensing. That is what will result in a PMT if you actually carefully see that. So if you find one of that, you correct that, the PMT will not happen. So PMT is not necessarily always due to retrograde activation only. It happens because of an event that allowed the first retrograde activation. One common reason is a PVC, which is not in your control. But the other uh, reasons for the uh, initiation of PMT is loss of atrial capture. Let's say there is a loss of atrial capture. It does an A-pace and then there is no uh, atrial depolarization. It starts an AV interval and paces the ventricle. Now, without an atrial depolarization in a dual chamber pacemaker, pacing the ventricle is equal to doing a VVI pacing. It's like you are introducing a PVC that might initiate a retrograde conduction. So in this case, the actual problem is not retrograde conduction. Although the patient has a retrograde conduction, it is the loss of atrial capture that resulted in a retrograde activation. So in this case, we want to increase the atrial, check the threshold, increase the atrial output. Similar thing can happen if there is a atrial oversensing or undersensing. If there's an atrial oversensing, then it starts an AV interval and paces where there is atrial oversensing, there is no P wave. So that uh, V pace after an atrial oversensing tracking uh, is equal to a PVC that can initiate a, a retrograde activation. So re recognize that, look for that. If you find evidence of that, correct that, then PMT will not happen. Right, so that's uh, simple, uh, you know, simple programming. So we want, we actually covered the mode, we covered the mode switch, we covered the AV interval, upper tracking rate and upper sensor rate, and uh, you know how to program, avoiding uh, the PMT, etc. And I'm sure uh, all the participants know how to program the outputs based on the threshold. I don't think we need to go into the detail of that because it is already 10 o'clock for you i think that it's it's uh, it is a reasonable uh, consideration to stop here and take questions and then uh, based on the comments of the experts we can take Robin, can, I, can i something? yes sir please Robin? yes sir you can please most go ahead the, we, implant, we, implant, we implant pacemega and most of the time we uh, depends on the that is six channels or if we uh, keep the mode DDDR. Yes, so sir. when the patient has to block, it will drain the battery. So yes, so we should uh, uh, use the mode as DDD. If the patient has chronotopic incompetence in six channels, in that that's, case, a, we should that's definitely a good DDDR. idea. Yes, that's a good idea. But in the most of the cases. And in most of the cases, we found the patient is DDR and better is losing. Yes, I, 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 I agree. I, I agree with you. Yeah. So even if you don't know whether the patient has good, uh, you know, sinus node function or not, at least at the first follow up, look at the atrial rate histogram. If there is a good, you know, distribution of the rate uh, in DDD mode, then, uh, you know, then you don't need to switch on the DDDR mode for that patient. And uh, in most cases, you know, clinically, uh, based on the background, whether this patient has a sinus node dysfunction patient or, uh, you know, good sinus node function patient. And as you pointed out, 
if it's a good sinus node function, it's good to maintain DDD mode. If not, then program to DDDR mode. And then when the patient returns back for the first follow-up after programming to DDD, and uh, if the rate distribution in the histogram is, you know, all the time towards the lower rates, then maybe you can consider programming to DDDR for that patient. Any other comments, sir? Okay. Thank you. Govind, can you stop your screen share, please? Yeah, sure. I'll do that. Yes, I've stopped, sir. Actually, uh, uh, this was the three talk series, na? Sir. Yes. Actually, two days. Actually, two days talk was more useful and practical. What we are facing every day. No. I think. Uh, Govind, possibly you have not finished your total talk. I have uh, complete. I mean, uh, the idea is to program, I mean, show the basic programming instead of going into complications, etc. So uh, I've kind of, uh, you know, if you want, I can go into the other details like the no. additional features no, that no, exist. Not today, but we, we want, uh, actually, uh, today is the final day, no? Yes. Yes, sir. So it was better if we had another one day for the Gobind, actually. Mm, total for uh, basics of programming, sir. Yeah, right, right. Basics of programming. This is the more useful part, I think. Agreed. Uh, yeah. I mean, we can consider having it on another day. Uh, uh, you know, Kazi can consider yes. organizing one, maybe sometime later, not necessarily next week. Whenever it's convenient for you all, we can program one more session, uh, okay. plan one more session, only concentrating on um, no the uh, other other factors of programming. Right, right, right. And this is my proposal to Metronic people. That is one day that is absolutely total Gobind session. So programming and yes. We are discussing yes. our everyday. Uh, but you will show, and that is the simultaneous. Uh, that is discussion, your presentation and discussion simultaneous. Then they yes, discuss. we can we can do that, sir. Sure. Yeah. Kazi, uh, I hope you are making a note. He's muted. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Apin, sir, Dr. Mohsin, sir, for coming up with this proposal of having dedicated session of uh, Mr. T.K. Govin. Uh, I believe uh, that will be helpful for all of us. And we will we'll quickly uh, come to you and... We have our Professor Amol yeah, Chaudhuri. Yeah. You can call. Uh, sir, uh, may I request Professor Amol Chaudhuri, sir, to give you some comments on this webinar today. Kazi, please unmute Amol, sir. Here is Amol, Ashok Dotto. Ashok Dotto, unmute, please. Dr. Amol, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, the, thank, the, thank you, Atarali, sir. Thank you for uh, uh, giving the opportunity to uh, tell something about the uh, pacemaker basic. Uh, thank you. Thank you. A nice presentation of Mahashin. I, 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 I uh, heard the, all the lecture of Mahashin. Very nice and very, very basic to me, but T.K. Govind, Dr. T.K. Govind's presentation is a uh, little, must, little uh, at the last, I feel some difficult to understand the programming. I think because we are not accustomed uh, regularly to do these things, so that it, it is the problem. But uh, I have once upon a time when I was in uh, Atharali Sars unit, uh, gone through all the programming of the pacemaker. Thank you. Oh, I have nothing to tell. I'm just I am learning from this lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We are, we are happy to see you and happy to see your nice library. <laughs> sir, this, sir, I have a library, but uh, uh, all books are holy books, sir. Most of <laughs> no sir. problem. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Book is book, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Th
लेक्चर बट partly i have missed uh, motion by your program sorry uh, i was busy uh, next time i will not present your lecture <clears throat> so thank you sir thank you very much i have learned a lot this is an excellent session excellent interaction especially your just putting some quiz some question that provoke govin to uh, give out all the uh, things that is really uh, uh, very much essential for us even at this level Uh, every day i am learning thank you sir and thank you gobin thank you uh, moshin bhai uh, yes. hoping for uh, hope for the uh, better program in the ne- uh, subsequent week thank oh, you sir okay ashok dato professor awad choudhary sir already sir mohan this time sir swadesh chakraborty swadesh chakraborty thank you thank you sir ek khol na swadesh uh good evening sir uh, thank you i have learned uh, all the three uh, sessions uh, and learned a lot uh, and it is uh, my pleasure to hear from you uh, from uh, mohsin sir and explanation of uh, adut sir ashok sir and uh, i must say uh, from tk govin i think uh, all things are very useful to me sir uh, i have a question i think uh, it is not uh, truly related to the today's session trouble shooting uh, but it is related to pacemaker complication one uh, sir uh, i faced a pavian vein thrombosis after of a device uh, so uh, i have, i want to know what should be the management strategy of patient of uh, pacemaker sir subclavian subclavian vein thrombosis yes yes sir, sir. <laughs> subclavian vein thrombosis presented with uh, upper limb uh, edema yes. i have one patient already i am following for last 10 years and uh, when i uh, want to put second lead then the patient came to the upper limb thrombosis and i also till now the patient uh, one to six month on the patient on That is the uh, at that time what sir and now the patient only on aspirin the patient is very good. Any other thing? I, I just only one for six weeks and and then they uh, regular follow up with aspirin. Uh, sir, your comment, sir. Ashok. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, on patient with dual chamber pacemaker, I tried to the that patient develop. Uh, LV dysfunction, so I tried for just I, uh, t- I took the patient in cath lab for upgrading to CRTP. Uh, when I did the uh, venogram, that shows stenosis of the left subclavian vein. So uh, that was very much stenotic actually. Uh, uh, so i did not do that case my plan was to dilate it uh, whether the case that shodish is telling whether that patient has got some abnormality in the subclavian vein that provoked the uh, venous stasis and thrombosis because only dual chamber pacemaker such a big vein cannot occlude cannot be occluded by to a small lead so is there any roll up uh, venogram To rule out the possible uh, physical cause of this uh, venous thrombosis, sir. Actually, uh, Shadesh, thank you very much for raising the issue. Uh, I have got experience of about nearly five cases. My own patient, I have seen acute subclavian vein thrombosis uh, in between. That is the after discharging the patient, the patient came in between the four to six, four two weeks to six months, I think. so i have got personal experience of dealing uh, nearly not less than five cases so this so Sir. the Sir. diagnosis is very easy clinically it is possible to see that a clinical diagnosis is possible and confirmation by the 
that is a duplex study. So diagnosis is not difficult. And all the cases, I have actually gone through the issues. Uh, what actually uh, told by Dr. Ashok Dotto, uh, I think there is no documented risk factors what precipitated the acute subclinical vein thrombosis, but it happened. It can happen nearly about 5% of the cases after implanting the uh, pacemaker, and I have seen it. And the uh, management, management is uh, just like the deep vein thrombosis. That is the, like the, uh, you can uh, treat with the clexin, sub, uh, that is rivaroxamine, and it takes about three months. And I have seen, that is the possibly yeah, still... step one. All the cases oh, yeah, actually recanalized, that is supplement recanalization happened. But one case did not happen. So this is my personal experience of dealing of such cases. And I treated accordingly. I did not give, uh, initially when there was no rivaroxamine, I gave the, that is the, um, uh, that is the enoxaparin followed by the warfarin. But recently, when the, even it, I experienced it about uh, six to eight months back. There was a case with the supplement thrombosis, and I treated with the rivaroxamine. So this is my personal experience. Thanks. Uh, sorry, for the sorry, it is related to sir trauma. Sir, sorry? it is related to trauma to the supplement vein, sir. Is yes. it related to trauma to the endothelium of the vein? Actually, I cannot give a comment, uh, make Maybe. comment on this issue. That is, the, what are the precipitating factors? But this is the reco uh, recognizable. That is the documented factor that it can happen. Maybe uh, related acutely if, if it happens after PPM within uh, four to six weeks, most, li most likely that is related to trauma right. uh, during subclavian puncture or lead uh, manipulation. Uh, uh, sir, any possibility of uh, thromboembolism like that happens in pulmonary embolism that, may, uh, that might uh, happen in uh, as it in the lower limbs? No, 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 no. That there is no possibility chance. is rare. There is no chance. Ultimately, that is a subclavian stenosis may be the consequence. That is a. Otherwise, uh, embolism mm -hmm. is not Sir. a, a, a recognizable complication. So, uh, how, how long we should continue the anticoagulation? Sir? So far, I know at least three months. Three months. Yes. Sir, my patient, my patient presented uh, uh, within four weeks of implantation of a dual chamber pacemaker. Uh, he had a history of riding a motorcycle for about two hours, uh, hanging that uh, hand, uh, the side uh, which the pacemaker was implanted. And I actually uh, diagnosed uh, with duplex study and uh, after anticoagulation with enoxaparin and I am uh, following up with him with rivaroxaban. And the edema subsided and uh, within it is three weeks now uh, edema subsided he is on river uh, and i will uh, follow up him after uh, another two or three weeks so i will i will request you to do the follow-up duplex study to duplex see. Study. sir sir sure sir. thank you uh, thank you sir, sir, sir i think sir, uh, I think, sir uh, more common in subclavian vein puncture rather than the axillary vein. If you go more deeper, I think it is uh, not, it is documented in the book, but it can be because the, there is a, uh, a rib and the vein, there is a, the angle is short, so that's why the movement, when patient good movement, there is a crash and a lead can crash and also the vein can trauma and the uh, it can precipitate this up. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yes, maybe. Sir, uh, I have uh, gone through literature with this issue, and I have found that, uh, as uh, you uh, rightly mentioned, it around 20% patient may have uh, subclavian vein thrombosis, uh, but most of the cases remain asymptomatic. Most of the cases yes. remain asymptomatic, and very few become uh, symptomatic. And uh, injury of the endothelium uh, it, is a cause. So most, most remain asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. so most any, remain any asymptomatic any and uh, uh, injury to the endothelium. Any big study regarding this? 20% uh, is a huge amount. Uh, uh, sir, uh, it, it, sir uh, one of the review articles uh, I, I have found. So we can do the uh, routine. Uh, 
duplex duplex of the left upper limb after no uh, as as uh, uh, there is not complete occlusion if there and, is no, uh, so, no symptom why do we do that we do routine uh, uh, for for study exactly, only exactly for study only whether it is oh, yeah. 20% <laughs> if we do the patient test. and yeah. among 10 patient if we get two patient uh, <laughs> subclinical uh, venous thrombosis then it is most likely very high very high percentage <clears throat> thank you atash sir so, so, uh, uh, yes ashok thank you for your participation actually uh, i wanted to hear a talk from you <laughs> <laughs> If I, 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 I wish, sir. I wish, sir. No, 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 no. Actually, I, this is my proposal to metronic people. I, I will request to arrange another uh, actually series or session with Govind and a talk from Ashok. Metronic. Now all together, sir. Okay. Govind will be common. Govind yes, is yes. common for all. And uh, the experience will 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 uh, participate separately with Govind uh, common to all. Right. Yes. Session was there, sir, but sir is very busy on Friday, sir. So <laughs> the day should be different <laughs> other than Friday. Then no shuksa will be available. Like yes, we <laughs> we will keep in mind in the the issue for the next time. Thank you, sir. So, so most of it you can conclude sir. the session huh, for today. Okay. Okay, sir. So we are at the end of the session today. Dear participants, I would like to conclude our last day of the three-day series on the basics of pacemaker. Hope you have uh, enjoyed a lot and enhanced your knowledge from the most experienced and skilled person, skilled persons in this field. And uh, thank you all for joining this webinar and or both the organizer of Medronic and all of the persons behind it. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Anirban Rai to say something. Anirban is available today no oh, um, uh, uh, sir I, i think uh, he is not here now oh come up straight sir go with possibly go with will finish the go with you want yeah to... sure sure sir yeah it was it was a great uh, experience to be able to get an opportunity to speak among uh, you know experienced uh, implanting electrophysiologists and uh, you know glad that i was able to provide some thoughts on uh, programming and the timing cycles earlier and uh, i would also like to thank all of you for uh, you know agreeing to be uh, you know faculty in this session and directing this session very clinically oriented and i also would like to thank dr mustafizur rahman for coordinating and comparing this session uh, ably thank you sir and uh, yeah thanks all uh, to kazi to conclude uh thank you thank you honorable facul uh, faculties uh, all the participants my colleagues uh, thank you for being with us uh, thank you for being with us throughout the series and uh, uh, thank you for the wonderful proposal uh, to uh, have uh, 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 to request us uh, to uh, for for uh, another episode with uh, uh, sorry 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 for uh sorry for the for the noise uh thank you for the proposal for uh, uh, conducting another uh, another series and at least session with uh, uh, tk govind and uh, ashok dutta sir and all of you and uh, I, i hope this little initiative has been of use and uh, we all have learned something thank you thank you all okay thank you thank you very much thank, thank you sir thank you, thank you everyone you thank you for joining sir thank you very much